Last year, U.S. enforcement agents seized more than 10,000 pounds of powder, enough to kill every single American. The Sinaloa cartel makes 10 cents on a pill that sells for $30 in the U.S. With profits like that, why would the Chapitos ever surrender? The answer might surprise you, and it's got the DEA on edge. July 2023, Texas. A private jet lands, and something unexpected happens. Joaquin Guzman Lopez, son of the infamous El Chapo, turns himself in to U.S. authorities. But he's not alone. He brings El Mayo, a top cartel leader, with him against his will. This isn't your typical arrest. It's a game changer. Why would a powerful cartel figure give up so easily? The DEA's been offering million-dollar rewards for the Chapados. There's more to this story than meets the eye. Did Joaquin cut a deal? What could make a man with everything risk it all? But this arrest was just the beginning of a dangerous game that would shake the Sinaloa cartel to its core. The DEA's playing for keeps, and the Chapitos are in their crosshairs. What happens next could rewrite the rules of the narcotics trade forever. But how is all this unfolding? Let's find out in today's video. So let's begin with the most obvious question. Why did Joaquin Guzman Lopez turn himself in? The answer might shock you and reveal the high-stakes game being played between Los Chapitos and the DEA. The Sinaloa cartel, once led by the infamous El Chapo, now operates under the shadow of his sons, known as Los Chapitos. But these aren't just small-time criminals. We're talking about a global operation spanning over 40 countries, with a reach that would make most multinational corporations jealous. Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar, Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar, Ovidio Guzman Lopez and Joaquin Guzman Lopez are the sons of El Chapo. Other than their regular illicit activities, they made the headlines due to brutal techniques they used on some of their victims, like feeding them to their pet tigers. Sons of the world's most notorious drug the U.S. Justice Department says the so-called Chapitos took control of the Mexican Sinaloa cartel when their father El Chapo landed in prison. At the heart of their empire? No. This synthetic opioid has become the cartel's golden goose, and the numbers are staggering. It costs the cartel mere pennies to produce a single pill in Mexico. We're talking 10 to 20 cents. But here's where it gets wild. That same pill can fetch anywhere from $5 to $30 on U.S. streets. Talk about a profit margin. But with great profit comes great risk. The DEA has put a hefty price tag on the heads of Los Chapitos. We're talking million-dollar rewards for their capture. $10 million each for Ivan, Alfredo, and Ovidio Guzman, and a cool $5 million for Joaquin Guzman Lopez. That's some serious cash, and it shows just how badly the U.S. wants to bring these guys down. The U.S. government has put out a $5 million bounty on the sons of convicted Lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Now, you might be thinking, with all that money and power, why would any of them even consider turning themselves in? It's a good question, and the answer lies in the high-stakes game of cat and mouse being played between the cartel and law enforcement. The DEA isn't pulling any punches. Ann Milgram, the agency's head honcho, has called the most urgent crisis that we face today as a country and the greatest threat to our national security. The Chapitos pioneered the manufacture and trafficking of the deadliest drug our country has ever faced. Ann Milgram, the U.S. Enforcement Administration, DEA chief, said at a 14th April press conference in Washington, a global DRG empire and made it more ruthless, more violent, and more deadly. She also described how deadly the substance has become for the people who consume it. These are people who gave to a man, watched him die, and then sent that same batch of to the United States. They know that they are poisoning and killing Americans. They just don't care because they make billions of dollars doing it. But here's where it gets interesting. Los Chapitos are playing defense, and they're doing it in the court of public opinion. They've gone on record denying any involvement in f production. They paint themselves as victims of persecution, targets of a witch hunt fueled by their father's notoriety. They said, we have never produced, manufactured, or marketed f or any of its derivatives. We are victims of persecution, and they made us a scapegoat, the brother said in the letter. Mexico's Millennio News Channel aired its contents on 3 May, along with an interview of Guzman family lawyer, Jose Refugio Rodriguez, who provided the broadcaster with the document. The Chapitos argue that their reputation has been unfairly tarnished by media narratives. A lie told a thousand times becomes a truth, they say. 
But here's the kicker. The Sinaloa cartel's involvement in fentanyl trafficking dates back to 2014. The DEA's most powerful tool in international narcotics trafficking is not guns or surveillance tech, but the power of a deal. The agency has a history of using plea bargains and witness protection to bring down notorious criminal organizations. And now, they are aiming at the Chapitos, hoping to crack the Sinaloa cartel's grip on the narcotics trade. The DEA's strategy involves cartel leaders negotiating for their freedom, offering reduced sentences and protection in exchange for cooperation. This simple yet effective approach has been used in the war on narcotics making it a tempting proposition for those facing life in prison or death from rival factions. The Chapitos, heirs to El Chapo's empire, face significant stakes in cooperating with U.S. authorities for reduced sentences and protection. However, the negotiation process is fraught with challenges, including tensions between the U.S. and Mexico over narcotics trafficking. As mentioned earlier, the Chapitos have publicly denied involvement in production, claiming they are victims of persecution. This raises questions about the sincerity of potential negotiations and whether they are willing to admit guilt and turn on their associates. The DEA has gained insider knowledge about the Sinaloa cartel, using their 18-month infiltration to gain a powerful edge in negotiations. However, the Chapitos, who have distanced themselves from the label of cartel leaders, are not a cohesive organization, complicating the DEA's efforts to negotiate with them as a unified entity. This makes it difficult to nail the target to a wall, as the target constantly shifts. The Chapitos face a complex situation in the narcotics trade, where accepting a deal is not just about legal consequences, but also a psychological one. The cartel culture is deeply ingrained, and breaking free from it is not just about signing a dotted line. The DEA's strategy is a high-stakes game, with every move potentially pushing or driving the Chapitos closer to a deal. The agency must balance reduced sentences with relentless pursuit, ensuring the Chapitos see the value in cooperation or risk taking their chances on the run. In the United States, there was an agreement between the individuals who were, shall we say, in custody with those who are free, Rodriguez told reporters, and there was a deal between them for the respective surrender so that they would go to the United States to surrender. The Sinaloa cartel, known for its adaptability and survival, may not be completely eradicated if the DEA manages to secure a deal with one or more Chapitos. This notorious criminal organization is like the Hydra, which can quickly replace a leader and let the Hydra to grow new heads. Their structure is more complicated uh, and perhaps more uh, usable for adaptation than the structure of other criminal groups. But how did they achieve this? Of course, they had help from the law enforcement. The Sinaloa cartel invested its money wisely. They offered bribes to officers and government officials. The crucial skill that set the Sinaloa Federation apart from other cartels is that while some were buying heavy weaponry, the Sinaloa cartel were buying politicians. In fact, this structure made them the best narcotics traffickers and organized criminals in Mexico. That's why even after their leader, El Chapo, was arrested and extradited to the USA, the cartel continued to thrive under the leadership of El Chapo's sons. But even after his imprisonment and now extradition, the organization El Chapo built is very much intact. Sigue siendo el cartel más fuerte, definitivamente. The DEA aims to defeat the Chapitos and end the Sinaloa cartel, but their success may lead to the rise of dark forces attempting to seize control of the narcotics empire. The Chapitos, once untouchable, are now in handcuffs, but the shadowy world of narcotics trafficking is never simple, and the fall of the Chapitos could signal the beginning of a new nightmare. The Sinaloa cartel, a narcotics empire with deep roots, may not crumble if all the Chapitos surrender. The cartel's operations are also like a hydra, as we mentioned before, with two new heads emerging each time it is cut off. The Guzman brothers, who claim to be not the leaders of the cartel, have a twist in their letter, indicating that the cartel's structure is more fractured than initially thought. El Mayo's faction is determined to keep the cartel's operations running and the Guzman brothers' refusal to be the leaders of the cartel further complicates the situation. Reports suggest Zambada's arrest has ignited violent infighting within Sinaloa. Clashes between rival factions loyal to Zambada and those aligned with other sons of El Chapo Guzman 
have led to a series of deadly gunfights in Culiacan, the capital of the state of Sinaloa. In recent weeks, schools and businesses have been forced to shut down as violence flared in the streets. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel, CJNG, is a notorious cartel that has been gaining ground in the narcotics trade. While arresting key figures like the Chapitos may seem like a quick solution to the problem, experts argue that it may not have a significant impact on the illegal narcotics market. This is because, as long as demand for narcotics like and f exists, someone will supply it, a concept that has been a topic of debate in the past. The DEA's top dog, Milgram, has deemed the f crisis, primarily driven by the Sinaloa cartel, the biggest threat to U.S. national security. The DEA is attempting to defuse the crisis by creating special units to target both the Sinaloa cartel and the CJNG, focusing on money, narcotics, and the entire operation. Betrayal in the cartel world is considered a death sentence, and if the Chapitos decide to cut a deal, they risk prison time and violent retaliation from their own people. This is a high-stakes game of chess, where every move could be your last. The fall of the Chapitos could signal the start of a new, potentially more violent and unpredictable chapter in the story, as the narcotics trade, like a balloon, expands in unpredictable ways, despite being squeezed in one place. The Sinaloa cartel is a threat to cartel members who cooperate with the DEA. When the walls start closing in, some members consider betraying their own, choosing between freedom or prison. The Chapitos, who are part of the Sinaloa cartel, face a more terrifying reality when they become the hunted. The cartel's reach extends beyond Mexico, and breaking the code of silence can lead to even more intense violence. Cooperation with the DEA is crucial for preserving the stability of the cartel. Past informants have experienced the harsh reality of crossing the line, witnessing the devastating psychological warfare of the cartel. They describe the fear of being caught, the constant threat of disappearance, and the potential for personal and loved ones to be targets. The cartel doesn't follow any rules when it comes to revenge, making it a frightening and terrifying experience for those who cross the line. In Mexico, they f their enemies to tigers, shooted them, airboarded them, and them at close range with a 50 caliber machine. In another instance, those defendants experimented on a woman they had been ordered to shoot. Instead, they injected her repeatedly with fat until she overdosed and died. One of the officers was shot for two hours before he was shot by Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar. Potential informants in the cartel world face not only the fear of retaliation, but also the emotional toll of leaving behind their past. Many members have grown up in this life, built their fortunes, and formed close relationships. There was 14 people. The main boss was de um, and they were playing basketball and, and with this. Were you ever scared for your life? Every day, that's how you live. Walking away means leaving behind luxury mansions, cars, and cash, but also turning away from people they once considered family. In the cartel world, loyalty is paramount, and breaking this bond is seen as a betrayal and cutting out part of one's soul. The DEA offers witness protection, reduced sentences, and financial incentives to cartel leaders. But these benefits may not match their life and protect them from cartel vengeance. The Chapitos, who claim they are being persecuted and scapegoated, face a dilemma on an international stage. If they decide to cooperate, they must convince authorities and public opinion that they are not just running scared. This dilemma is playing out on an international stage. The Sinaloa cartel's structure makes it difficult to decide on a leader, as the organization operates at the speed of light in creating adept replacements. This means that even if some Chapados cooperate, others will always step up. The real price of betrayal is not just financial or time behind bars, but also sleepless nights, broken relationships, and constant fear of the past catching up with oneself. For some, this price is too high, while for others, it may seem like the only way out of an impossible situation. The DEA believes they are winning the war on narcotics, but a power vacuum is emerging as the Sinaloa cartel crumbles. This could change the entire landscape of organized crime in Mexico and beyond. The Sinaloa cartel has been a dominant force in the narcotics trade, particularly in fentanyl and methamphetamine distribution. The DEA believes this could set the stage for an even deadlier era. However, the demand for narcotics like and fentanyl is not going away anytime soon. 
Even if the Chapitos and their crew are down, someone else will step up to meet the demand. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel, CJNG, is emerging as the frontrunner. The CJNG has been waiting to capitalize on weaknesses and rivals, like vultures circling wounded prey. The fall of the Sinaloa Cartel has led to a chain reaction in the criminal underworld, causing increased territorial disputes, and a scramble for power. This chaos could spill over into the US and other countries, affecting everything from street-level narcotics dealing to international money laundering operations. The CJNG has been learning from the Sinaloa cartel's mistakes and is ready to take over, potentially becoming more dangerous than their predecessors. The consequences of this chaos could be catastrophic for both Mexico and the US. The DEA has created specialized units to target the Sinaloa cartel and the CJNG's financial and narcotics trafficking structures. However, the Chapitos claim the cartel is not a unified organization, but rather a group of independent groups under the same brand name. If the Chapitos fall, El Mayo's faction of the Sinaloa cartel could attempt to take control, or a third party may emerge. The Sinaloa cartel's current global influence extends beyond Mexico, with connections in Asia, Europe, and South America. If they collapse, it could disrupt global narcotic supply chains, potentially leading to more dangerous narcotics. The Guzman brothers have suggested that the DEA should consider other parties involved in fentanyl production, arguing that the fentanyl crisis is a complex issue with roots beyond any single cartel. This could result in more dangerous narcotics on the streets as new, inexperienced players try to fill the gap. The DEA's crackdown on the Chapitos cartel could lead to a new era in the global narcotics trade, potentially making it even more dangerous and unpredictable than the current one, as the fall of the Sinaloa cartel could significantly impact Mexico and the world. So, what's the current state of the Chapitos? Well, they are facing increasing pressure as the DEA tightens its grip on them. The Guzman brothers appear to be running out of moves, but their appearances can be deceiving in the shadowy world of cartels. The DEA is offering millions in bounty for the Chapitos, making business as usual no longer an option. This raises questions about the length of time these brothers can stay in the game. The Guzman brothers have publicly denied involvement in the crisis in the US. They wrote an open letter to DEA and claimed they are not even the leaders of the Sinaloa cartel and have never produced, manufactured, or marketed no. This move is a classic move from the cartel playbook. Deny, deflect, and point the finger somewhere else. The brothers are suggesting other Sinaloa groups are behind ill production and are begging the DEA to look elsewhere saying they are not the bad guys and should focus on the real criminals. We have never worked with although there are many in Sinaloa that do produce it, and that's why we have seen the recent seizures. But those laboratories have a name and a last name. Do some research. You would only need to send a single agent to Sinaloa, the Guzmans wrote in the letter. The letter additionally said, this is harming us and is becoming international propaganda used to their only benefit. The DEA is not interested in the Chapito's surrender as they have been pursuing them for years. The end game could be a dramatic surrender daring escape, or something else entirely. However, even if the Chapitos turn themselves in, the Sinaloa cartel might not end. The organization's structure is complex and deeply rooted, and experts believe that even without the Chapitos, the cartel could continue to tick. The ongoing narcotics cartel conflict between the US and Mexico is not just about narco lords and DEA agents, but also about the US-Mexico relations and the ongoing war on narcotics. The DEA is frustrated with Mexico's inaction in fighting the cartels, while Mexican authorities argue that the real problem lies on the US side of the border. The Chapitos have several options, including running, surrendering, or getting caught, which could lead to retaliation from the cartel. The situation is not particularly appealing. The Guzman brothers are using their last name to portray themselves as victims of their father's legacy, claiming they are unfairly targeted. This strategy aims to gain sympathy and raise public doubt. However, the situation remains a high-stakes chess game between the cartel and law enforcement, with every move having consequences, and one wrong move could lead to the entire house of cards falling down. The narcotics cartel law enforcement conflict is a complex and ongoing battle. 
while the DEA's efforts to dismantle the Sinaloa cartel through deals with the Chapitos may seem like a victory, the reality is more complicated. The narcotics trade operates in cycles, with one cartel falling and another rising. Even if the Sinaloa cartel collapses, groups like the Jalisco New Generation cartel remain. DEA Administrator Ann Milgram called Fent the most urgent crisis that we face today as a country, but as long as there's demand, there will always be supply. The names may change, but the game remains the same. In the world of cartels, the only certainty is uncertainty. So, what did you think of today's video? Do you think the DEA will be able to crack down on Sinaloa's well-established business and take them out of the market? Let us know in the comments below.